Many viewers of this channel are particularly interested in one very small aspect of human activity in the past, and that is fighting. Now, it is true that of course people in the past did fight, and it is also true that it's quite interesting. Um, but it is also true that they did really very little of it. Most people didn't fight, and even those who did fight, even professional soldiers, spent almost all of their lives not fighting. Even when they were on campaign, most of the time not fighting. So perhaps it's more efficient of me uh, to deal with another topic which takes into account one third of all human activity in the past. That's right, there was something that people in the past spent one third of their lives doing. Can you imagine that? Yes, you can, because you do it as well. That's right, lying in bed. Now, in this video, uh, I am going to admit now, in the interests of openness and honesty, that there is product placement. But in order to engender an interesting sense of mystery and suspense, no revelation will be made by me, at least not for a while, as to which product has been placed in this video. Although you may be interested to know that I'm using new equipment. Can you tell? This is my new camera and uh, you're hearing me through uh, my new sound recording equipment. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Now, in the past, uh, people tended to sleep in much larger groups than we do today. Um, I watched, uh, for instance, a very interesting set of documentaries by an anthropologist who went out and lived with various tribes around the world. And one thing that was quite noticeable was that they tended to sleep in, in quite large numbers. In one uh, African mud hut, I remember his sharing, for instance, with a load, load of tribes. And there were just loads of people almost piled on top of each other all around. And they thought this was completely normal. And well, why shouldn't they? Now, I, I, I read quite a lot about some Solomon Islanders who were brought to Britain uh, for various projects, including a documentary. And um, when on hunting expeditions on the native Solomon Islands, they would uh, sleep huddled together, almost spooning each other. These tough adult men, that's the way they would normally sleep. And again, they thought it was completely normal. But when they were brought to Britain, they were out of habit by the producers of the television show, given a room each because, well, it would be rude to treat them like children and put them all into one room. No, 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 these are adult men. Give them all their own room. Well, they wondered what on earth they'd done wrong to, to receive this sort of treatment. And why were they being isolated like this? And it was explained to them, well, this is the way we normally do things here. But they asked a very simple question. But what if one of us had a nightmare? He would be alone. Yeah, well, people in the past tended not to want to be alone. Solitary confinement is considered by almost all uh, societies to be a severe punishment. In fact, it's considered so severe that, it, that uh, a lot of uh, modern prisons have outlawed it because it can have such, such terrible psychological effects on people. So people tended to sleep in larger numbers. Partly it's because uh, of greater poverty, you might say. Uh, more people had to share fewer buildings. Uh, but also it was perhaps by choice and by natural inclination of humans. Um, now, it could be that we today... I don't know this. What do I know? I'm just some bloke off YouTube. But it could be that we today are not as happy as we might otherwise be because uh, we sleep so isolatedly. Um, we associate being able to afford our own home. Ah, oh, my own home at last. Ah, oh, my own front door at last. Ah, oh, my own room at last. Ah, oh, my own bed at last. This ability to afford our own individual isolated bed in a room in a house with the, everyone else is excluded from, so we end up being alone because we could afford it. Um, there is perhaps a reason behind why we associate higher status with um, greater, if you like, loneliness, and that is that in the past, the, the lord and lady of the manor of the, of the house would perhaps sleep apart in their own room, whereas everyone else would just sleep on the floor clustered around the, the central hearth in the main hall. Um, but actually, even the lord and lady in their own uh, separate room, and there might only be one bedroom, actually purpose-built bedroom in a, in a large hall, they weren't really alone as we think of it. I mean, they're not completely alone. I mean, they've got servants, of course, um, and, and the children, of course, and then there's, there's the tall, but the guard dog, and uh, there's the tiersel, uh, you know, the falcon on its perch. Um, so in their bedroom, there are actually quite a few bodies breathing through the night. 
uh, uh, one common thing would be to have a raised master bed for the the the, uh, the, the lord and lady of the manor and a truckle bed uh, also known as a trundle bed um, this would be uh, on rollers and it would pull out from underneath the bed and, and like a drawer and uh, the children or servants would sleep on that and perhaps they'd have to get up early and uh, set everything to right again and push it uh, back before waking up the, the lord and lady it was a, uh, a sign of status to have the higher bed and uh, the, it's gone out of usage now but to truckle, the verb to truckle, used to mean to adopt a subservient position. Um, so you know, people would, we will not truckle to these fiends, people might have said, uh, but they don't anymore, it's gone out of usage. Uh, so um, there is that, that, that distinction then between the, the, the commoner who perhaps might sleep in a dormitory in a hall and, and the lord and lady who might have a measure of privacy, but actually not the privacy that we're used to today. So one way of showing that you are high status is through your bed, and beds were much more important uh, in the ancient and medieval worlds than they are today. Today everyone can afford a bed and most people's beds are really quite plain. Um, but a bed was a great way to show off wealth. But wait a minute, why would people show off wealth today through their bed? Because other people don't really see the beds. We don't, we don't receive guests in our bedrooms today. Well, no, we don't. But in the past, things were different. I remember watching the, uh, the quite good film, um, Girl with a Pearl Earring, uh, which is set in Renaissance Holland. And uh, you may notice, it's not, they don't draw attention to it particularly in, in the film, but you may notice that when they've got guests in and they're sitting around the dining table and they're trying to impress people with their, their, the meal that they've laid on, in the background, in the same room, there is a massive bed. Yeah, it's, it's a much more publicly on-show piece of furniture in the past, but not anymore. We, we tuck them away. It's more of a private thing. Sleeping and, and beds and so forth in the modern world is a much more private thing. So um, what were uh, beds of, of the ancient and medieval world made out of? Well, obviously they weren't made out of two-part epoxy resin putty because that would be a ridiculous and frankly inappropriate and out of period material. No, uh, the, the frame would be unsurprisingly wooden. Uh, iron bedsteads, metal bedsteads don't appear till very late. Uh, iron springs in, in beds don't appear until the 1860s and 70s at the very earliest. So a wooden frame is pretty much standard through all cultures, at least all cultures that I'm familiar with. Um, uh, the ancient Greeks might stretch some hide or, or weave uh, straps of leather to, to create a, a net on which the mattress would, would be placed. Uh, ropes were extremely common right through to really quite modern times, to the 20th century. So you have uh, ropes going that way, ropes going that way, all pulled tight, and that would form a sort of net on which you, you put the, your, your mattress to, to sleep comfortably through the night. And supposedly this is an origin of the expression uh, to sleep tight, as in, you know, sleep well, sleep tight, don't let the bugs bite, um, because the ropes were prone to stretching over time, and so every now and then you'd have to tauten everything up and tie a new knot in it. Um, I'm always sceptical with these, on that's the origin of the phrase, blah, blah, blah um, stories, because I've heard so many of them, and they're so often contradictory and, and somewhat groundless, so I, you know, to be taken with a pinch of salt, that is where the expression to sleep tight comes from, the ropes. Um, so you've got your bed and on top of that goes a mattress and the mattress is essentially a big bag of often canvassy material that was stuffed with with what? Well it depended on how rich you were of course. Uh, with poor people it was often things like heather, bracken, ferns, pea pods interestingly uh, were used and um, I wonder about those. I can see that if, if they dried out they'd be quite sort of stiff. They've got those arches so they'd be quite sort of stiff and springy and of course if, you, if you're harvesting a large number of peas you will have enough pea pods to fill an awful lot of mattresses so it was a cheap available thing. I would have thought though that, that after a while they would start crunching and breaking down and the whole thing would, would sag uh, but then maybe that was something they just put up with and just, and just replenished it with more pea pods. Um, I also think though wouldn't it be a bit noisy? I mean, I assume that these are dried pea pods. You wouldn't use fresh ones because it would all go rotten and horrible. Um, yeah, anyway, so pea pods, apparently. Um, straw, of course, uh, was used quite a bit. Um, and uh, you could also use uh, hair and rags and wool. And if you're a 
bit uh, richer, feathers. You didn't have to be tremendously wealthy to have a feather mattress, but it was you know, one of the more upmarket uh, things to stuff a mattress with. Uh, we know that by uh, Queen Elizabeth I's time, a reasonably well-off tradesman might have as many as three feather mattresses in his, in his house, so they weren't, they weren't completely uh, out of the reach of, of everyone barring their the most high status. Um, but if you wanted a show off, you could have a fabulously ornate bed. And beds got really ornate, particularly in the, in the later medieval period. Now, um, there's something called a tester. Now, a tester uh, is not, as some people think, a four-poster bed. That's, it's not quite the same thing. It's, it's a canopy that goes above. Uh, they're often suspended from the ceiling. And uh, why would you want a canopy over your bed? Well, uh, one reason is that uh, if you lie in a pretentious hotel today in a four-poster bed and look upwards, you'll probably just see the ceiling. But you shouldn't see the ceiling because the four-poster really should have its own ceiling, a canopy, a tester over the top. And uh, if you're in a, a room in an early hall which had no ceiling, then as you looked up into rafters and so forth, all the rats scuttling about and, and, and dropping things on you, all the dead wasps falling out, you didn't want those particularly landing on you or on your bed during the night, so you would have a canopy and they would land on that instead. Um, but when the four-poster came along, um, the, 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 the testers are coming in the 13th century. The, 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 the familiar uh, type of bed where you have a high headboard and a low footboard, uh, that's pretty much become standard by the 12th century. Testers about 13th century. In the 14th century, uh, you start to see uh, four-posters beds. And nobody knows exactly where they came from, but there is this idea that they originated in Austria. It's certainly true that the British embraced them wholeheartedly, and uh, they became very common in Britain, and uh, remained so. Uh, they, they went out of use, actually, in the mid-19th century, so they lasted a fair old while. Um, so one reason for the uh, the four-poster bed is, of course, to show off. Wow, look at the bed I've got! And some of them were huge, heavy, fantastically intricately carved things covered in all sorts of opulent stuff, you know, peacocks' feathers and pearls and emus' eggs and that sort of thing. Um, but there are practical elements. It was a room within a room. You see, um, if you want to be warm on a cold winter's night and they're not particularly warm medieval home, then if you've got a room within a room with a, a, a low ceiling and thick velvet curtains down the sides, you're going to be much warmer. You'll have a, a candle or a lamp hanging or on a, on a little little hook somewhere on the inside so you, you can see what's going on. Uh, it also gets you a bit of privacy from your children and your servants and your guard dog and all the other, all the other living beings in the room that you're staying in. So, um, they were a practical thing. They kept you warmer and they gave you some privacy. They were a room within a room. So that was why the four-poster bed became so popular. And um, the, the modern four-poster bed is often uh, just... The, the, the curtains are on the corner, the posts are just there for decoration. They might not even reach all the way across. A thick, velvet, insulating, opaque curtain was what uh, the original things would have had. And with, with fur trimming to keep the drafts out on the uh, the edges of the curtains. And what fur trimming would you have? Well, that would depend on your status. Uh, if you had something like ermine, then whew, you must be pretty regal. Uh, but if you're a member of the ordinary middle classes, you might just have, say, squirrel fur on the edges of your curtains. Um, now, this was not just enforced by uh, convention and fashion, as you might think, though it, it was, uh, but it goes further than that it was actually enforced by law. Yep, the law stated quite definitely what social rank you had to have in order to use certain kinds of fur trimming. And they liked their laws, the people of the medieval world. Now, um, you can show status. Uh, one thing you can show uh, status with is, of course, when you travel. And if you travel, how do people know you're incredibly high status? <laughs> you take your bed with you. So an awful lot of these high status beds were collapsible and put on the back of a massive wagon and they were then taken to wherever you were going. Um, more modest travellers would still travel perhaps with their own bedding. It's always nice to know that wherever you end up you can uh, get some decent bedding, but you could then have your servants reassemble, if you're a, you know, a major lord, your bed in the new place that you're going, and this, this bed would have your coat of arms, perhaps, on it, and other things to show just what a great guy you were. 
and uh, the exoticism uh, went uh, you know quite far. They, they would use silks from the Far East and so forth. In in 1348, Isabella, who was wife of uh, Sir William Fitzwilliam, had imported an Indian bed, very ornate, with a load of Indian carpets. So there you go. Clearly, she was a woman with whom to be reckoned. Um, other people went even further, of course. Uh, perhaps the most extravagant of the French kings, Louis XIV, uh, he had 413 massive opulent beds. That's more than one for every day of the year. Uh, so I dare say a lot of them didn't uh, get used by him very much. Still, it's nice to have a few spares for guests. Um, uh, but just to show just how amazing he was, uh, he went a bit further than that and had a bed in Parliament. So as the men of Parliament were standing up and debating the important issues of the day. Uh, they stood on the benches and they, they, they held forth. Uh, there would be, perhaps in the corner of their vision, the king reclining on a bed, listening or perhaps not paying all that much attention to what they were saying. What a guy! What a git! Um, now, um, so you could show status through your bed and you might travel with your bed. But maybe if you were travelling and you weren't so high status, you might not be able to afford to do all that. And you might have to throw yourself on, on the charity of, say, a monastery. Now, monasteries had a Christian duty to accommodate anyone who needed accommodating. And a lot of people uh, took advantage of this Christian duty and so would show up at the monastery and say, oh, I know, would you believe it? They got caught out in the weather again and I've run out of money, etc. And uh, so many people did this, in fact, that monasteries typically had a massive dormitory building for this purpose, uh, which would also have a kitchen attached and they could provide food. Uh, of course, you might not necessarily be given the best bed, particularly if you were some lowly beggar type. Uh, so if you wanted them um, to be uh, well treated, you needed to know um, just who to be nice, whom to be nice to, and uh, perhaps you know slip a few farthings to, uh, to get the the better room, the more the more uh, private, secluded rooms away from all the people coughing. Um, talking of coughing, you might if you're. A, you're, you're even worse off than, than 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 that. You might end up in a hospital. Now a hospital. Today we think of, of them as filled with nurses and people rushing r rushing around with, with trolleys uh, shouting jargon at each other and machines, machines that go beep. But instead a hospital comes from the same root as the word hospitality. They were specifically set up for accommodating people, poor people who couldn't afford uh, anywhere else to go. Uh, so if you were desperate you could always turn up at a hospital uh, for a bed for the night. Although you really wouldn't choose to if you could afford not to because hospitals were full of ill people and old people and infirm people and lepers and beggars and, and miscreants and, and ne'er-do-wells. So um, you wouldn't, if you ended up in a hospital things were going pretty bad in the medieval period. But they were there. There was that, uh, there was that charity, if you like, to, to, to catch the poorest in society. Um, and you could, of course, also stay at an inn. Uh, but even at an inn you might be expected to share a bed. Share a bed with perhaps a total stranger. Um, some people went to inns in the hope of sharing a bed with a total with, with, with uh, other uh, businessmen so that they could, over pillow talk, conduct business. Um, so the world was different. People were, were uh, not expecting privacy in sleeping quarters the way we do today. Well, I don't know about you, but after all that talking, I'm ready for a drink. So I'm going to have some milk. <sighs> Lanchester Dairies. Milk from real cows. Now, after this, I'm going to get a bit random. I hope you don't mind random. It seems that quite a lot of my viewers are quite OK with random, so it'll be a bit random. Now, uh, what did uh, people make their sheets out of? Well, in places like Britain, uh, linen was the commonest material for people who could afford it. There were other fibres available. Um, nettles, for instance, make perfectly good uh, fibres for making things like sheets out of. But linen was the the one that you would get if you could. Uh, it was their equivalent, I suppose, of cotton. Cotton wasn't really around much at the time. Um, cotton would have been staggeringly expensive and exotic, uh, whereas linen, though it requires an awful lot of work to make, uh, it does last quite a long time and it would be prized. You would keep in your linen cupboard in your linen closet, you keep your prized linen sheets. They were valuable. Um, and uh, so was your bedding. People's possessions we know about from things like auctions and wills and, and, and court cases where things were contested, people's uh, inheritances, inheritances and so forth. So we have lists of people's worldly possessions, everything they have. And it's 
<clears throat> to modern eyes, staggering how important the bed is. It's often right at the head of the list. It's often the most expensive single item someone owned. And half of the itinerary, some of the ones I've seen, half of it is bed related stuff, things for heating the bed, the bed pans, all the, 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 the bits of the bed, the curtains for the bed, the bed spreads, the quilts, the sheets, the all that stuff that goes with the bed um, was a huge part of what someone owned. They were hugely important to people. And, and if you're, you're trying to imagine what expenditure people um, had, what things they owned, well, don't miss out beds because that was hugely important. Um, I'm going to hop back to the Roman period now because I can and, and tell you that the, in the Roman period there were several different kinds of bed because the Romans used beds for more things. They didn't just sleep on beds, they would also have a study bed. Separate from their sleeping bed, you understand, time to get up and lie on my study bed and then read the works of Homer and oh, is it time to eat? Oh, well, I'll get off this bed and then I'll go into the dining room and lie on another sort of bed and eat. And then I will perhaps, oh, is it time to die? Be carried to my tomb on another sort of bed. They liked a variety of beds did the Romans. Um, another thing is that a lot of beds, they're almost a semi-sitting posture. They're quite short. There were loads of cushions at the, at the head end uh, so that people would be fairly upright. I'd find that rather uncomfortable, I don't know about you. I like to stretch out. But um, uh, that was moderately common in the late medieval, early Renaissance. And uh, one of the reasons for this was a weird Christian belief that uh, it somehow stopped the devil getting into you. I don't know. So what do people wear in bed? Ah, good question. Uh, well, I can't really cover this in great detail, but um, for, say, 14th century England, women would wear pretty much what they wore during the day. So they would have a long dress, and of course their hair would be covered, very important, and uh, they would wear that at night. And for poorer people, it might actually be the same dress, uh, but uh, richer people would have another dress to change into. Men were a bit freer to be nude, particularly when at uh, their own home, um, but even then they might have a nightcap. Uh, if they were staying at uh, a friend's home, they'd have you know, at least their, their underpants on, their braise. Um, sometimes they wore nightshirts. So uh, one of our main pieces of evidence for that are accounts of uh, times when someone's got caught uh, in the wrong place and had to jump out of a window and onto a horse and gallop off into the night wearing just his nightshirt. Oh, you had a nightshirt on, did you? Okay. Uh, although I suppose you could say that he had time to throw on his nightshirt before jumping onto the horse. Um, Literature doesn't always record that detail. Uh, hammocks. I wanted to say something about hammocks. Now, um, I've seen many representations in art of um, ancient and medieval um, settings where you've got a hammock somewhere, particularly on board a ship, because, you know, it's, it's natural, isn't it? And you would think, wouldn't you, a hammock? It's a very simple idea. You know, it's a rectangle of cloth and you string it between two trees or two whatever. And hey, presto, you've got something that you can swing comfortably on. But actually, there's no evidence for hammocks until explorers got to the new world and when the conquistadors and people like that saw in South America and Mesoamerica the natives using these hammock things they thought hey that's a that's a good idea do you know what that might work on a ship too because it would swing with the movement of the ship let's try it on the ship on the way home and uh, it's only then that the the hammock reaches Europe and it's only after that period that you get uh, hammocks on ships uh, I was watching Game of Thrones recently. I know it's a fantasy thing, but it is set. It is, it, it is based on the real world, even if it's not set exactly in the real world. And uh, in that there was a scene aboard a ship, and yes, they had hammocks in the background. Mm, sort of wrong. Um, so there you go. Hammocks. I know, it's such a simple idea. Um, so we have these itineraries that say that beds were really, really important, that people spent an awful lot of their money on them, as well as a third of their lives in them. Uh, today, we're all so rich that we can all afford a, a decent bed and, and cotton sheets are very, very cheap. You can get a, a decent cotton sheet for five quid. Uh, but a linen sheet back in the medieval period would, would set you back quite a lot of money. So you'd really look after it. Um, and beds could get famous. Oh, yes. How many famous beds? Go on, go on. How many famous beds can you name? Huh? Huh? Right. Well, Soon you'll be able to name at least one. The Great Bed of Ware. Of Ware? Yes, of Ware. It's a place in England. Oh, they must have had such fun with that name. Do you think you're going to Ware? Yes, I am. No, to, to where are you going? I know I am. Oh, you see, I must have been just wonderful. Anyway, an enterprising innkeeper at the White Hart Inn in Ware, which is about one day's ride outside of London, had an idea. What if I commissioned the building of a really... Big 
bed. I mean, a really big bed, huge bed. And uh, then people in London could you know, possibly make use of this bed for whatever people in London do with beds. I don't know about what the fancy city folk do, but um, you never know, it might prove popular. And so it did. It is an enormous bed. I say is, you can go and see the Great Bed of Ware. It still exists. It's in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Uh, it's roughly square, about 11 feet across. It's in room 57A, I think. And it's hugely ornate with all sorts of carvings of figures and so forth. And uh, they've, they've got a reconstruction of it as well. It shows what uh, what it would have looked like with all, all the original curtains and so forth. Quite, uh, quite bright and gaudy. Um, it was colossal and became famous in its day. It's mentioned in quite a few uh, literary texts. Probably it's best known for its uh, mention in uh, Twelfth Night by William Shakespeare. Although all he says about it is an analogy making clear that it was really big. Whereas other people show that perhaps it was a little bit more infamous. Um, it would uh, take four couples very comfortably. They could hardly t they didn't need to touch each other. But uh, 12 or 15 people sometimes would use this and have presumably quite a good time. And uh, in commemoration of this, many of them uh, carved their names or initials and little love hearts and so forth into the wood and uh, put wax, blobs of wax on it and used their seal rings. So it seems they weren't particularly shy of letting the world know that they had used the great bed of where. Of where? Yes, of where. <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, I'm going to uh, just pull this over here. Hang on a second. Uh, oh my God, uh, there's no way I can do this really subtly. Uh, yeah, there we go. And um, yes, now we get to the inspiration for this video. Yes, this uh, was what started all this. Why am I doing a video about beds? Well, because incredibly, and I do find this silly, but there you go. Somebody sent me a free mattress. Yes, that's right, a free mattress, but, but, but wanted me to do an unboxing video of it. And I thought about this and I thought, well, is it really, is it really relevant? I mean, do my viewers really uh, want to see an unboxing video of, of, a, of a bed uh, and to hear much about beds? I mean, are, are they interesting? Well, I hope I've made a history of beds at least faintly interesting, but if I failed you, I'm terribly sorry. But anyway, at least I've, I've, I've couched this video, you know, in, in, in terms that are pertinent to the, the product that's been placed in it. A mattress. Um, and I thought a little bit uh, more about it and I asked, you know, what, are my viewers really interested in this? And they came back with a rather interesting and possibly even chilling reply, which was, everybody has to sleep sometime. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I had a point. I mean, it doesn't matter what you're interested in. If you're watching a video, you're a person who will have to sleep, and so you'll probably want a mattress. Uh, so in terms of you know, market marketing, uh, it's not that unreasonable, I suppose. All right, so on a history uh, uh, channel like this one, a history and ranting or whatever dance channel, yes, a mattress video, why not? But I was still a little bit uncomfortable, and I said, OK, I'll do it, but on one condition, let me make this very clear. I must be allowed to take the piss. Seriously though, unboxing videos, I just don't get them. I mean, I'm required to do one for this, but I still don't just get them. I mean, do people have some weird fetish? Oh, am I allowed to say fetish? Oh, said it twice now. Well, at least it didn't say Anyway, uh, they've got this thing, it seems, about packaging material. Why do people watch unboxing videos? If I want uh, a camera or something, I'm not going to buy it on the strength of the box it comes in. And yet there are people who watch really quite long unboxing videos in which they say, oh, it comes in a box. Well, of course it comes in a box. And, oh, it's got things printed on the outside of the box. I don't care. Does anybody? And when you open the box, it's got packaging material on the inside. So what? I'm going to throw it away anyway. Oh, it comes with a lead so that you can plug it in. Well, of course it does. And the lead is held together with a little twist of wire that you take off like this. I don't care. Um, but anyway, is there anything in it? Is there, any, is there anything in it for, for you, my dear esteemed, and if I may say so, strikingly handsome viewer, uh, in watching this particular unboxing video? Well, maybe, maybe, maybe I can make it entertaining, but also maybe there's something in it for you because you might get a cheap mattress. Now, one of the chief selling points of the Casper mattress is that it is cheap. It's cheap because they have no uh, showrooms and so they don't have to burden the cost of showrooms, which they then have to pass on to you, the customer. Um, uh, it's all done online. And if you go, if you, specifically you, yes you, go to www.casper.com stroke Lindy Beige and type in the secret code. The secret code, the secret code, what could it be? Ow, predictable.
then if you're British, you get £50 off the cost of a mattress, and if you're American, you get $50 off, which I must admit seems to be the better deal for the Brits. But anyway, um, if you're from somewhere else and you type in the secret code, um, I don't know what happens. Actually, I genuinely don't, don't know what happens, but uh, try it. Nothing bad can happen. I very much doubt the universe will explode. It's done that once already, and that's quite enough for any universe. Now, so cheapness is one of the selling points. Um, uh, although in the sales blurb they do somewhat overdo it, um, they describe the price as shockingly fair. Well, how much is it? <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, they didn't really think that one through. And as for the comfort, as afforded by the memory foam, uh, which gives you the sink and the springy latex foam for the bounce, uh, they describe that as outrageous. Oh, for God! I... No way I can sleep. I'm just so outraged by how comfortable this mattress is. Well, you join me now at the bottom of the box for the final opening. I hope you're not too squeamish. Now, some of you, some of you may be sick, sick with fear that you might get one of these home and then find out that it doesn't give you the exact sink to bounce ratio that your lifestyle demands. What could you do? Well, uh, you could, of course, go to a showroom and have a look at mattresses there, but you may find yourself being a little bit self-conscious and you may find it, it almost impossible to bring yourself to try out everything on the mattress in the showroom that you intend to do when you get the mattress home. So, well, instead, you could get one of these delivered for no charge. Yes, that's free shipping to your home. And then you've got 100 days to try it out. And if you decide you don't like it, you can just ring them up and say, I don't like it. And then they will come along and for no charge, they will take it away. And you need never, ever see it again. And they refund you. So there's no risk. I'm going in. It's vacuum packed in an amazingly dense bundle. And there it is. Okay, right, well, now I've got the box off, I can find out what this baby can really do. I could use it for a commando assault course crawl tunnel. Come on, you horrible little man, get a move on! What is the matter with you? Get right, move on! Um, I see my auntie Mabel go faster than that, she's had six Sergeant. hip replacements! Yes, sir? Sergeant, yes. Uh, I know you mean well, but the shouting really isn't helping. So if you don't mind, if you could just sort of keep it down, that's a good chap. Yes, sir. Thank you. Or it could be a choo-choo train. Woo -hoo. Yeah, it would be cuter if I had kids. Oh, how about a geostationary communication satellite? Of course, it could be an impenetrable bastion of defense. You'll never take me! <laughs> I see armour. And gentlemen in England, now abed, shall think themselves accursed they were not here, and hold their manhoods cheap, while any speaks who fought with us Upon St. Crispin's Day! Um, I hope they don't want the box back.